you could literally watch JWST streak across the Hubble field in real time. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson here again. I hope you've had a wonderful week and haven't melted in the 40 degree heat like I have. If you've been keeping any kind of eye on the science news over the last couple of weeks, you can't have failed to have seen the beautiful new images from the newly minted James Webb Space Telescope. This phenomenal new observatory has given us an entirely new perspective on the universe around us and our minuscule place within it, and has triggered more than a few existential crises among astronomers. Of course, we should not forget the veteran space observatory that has served us and will go on serving us faithfully for the last 30 years. The Hubble Space Telescope is not dead, even if it may have wandered into the shadow of its larger, flashier, more media-savvy daughter for the time being. Although it's natural to do so, we shouldn't look at the two telescopes as rivals. Each is capable of seeing in different wavelengths of light, and therefore capable of revealing unique features in physics when staring out into the cosmos. As amazing as James Webb Space Telescope is, and it is pretty amazing, a true Swiss army knife of universal analysis, it cannot take data in the past. At least, I don't think it can. Scientists will still be using Hubble data to check that JWST observes what we expect and to look at how transient objects such as supernovae have appeared and diminished over the last couple of decades. Hubble is not dead. Not by a long shot. Yeah, 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 I'm still about. <laughs> There's also something else that Hubble can do that Webb cannot. Webb cannot observe Hubble, but by my calculations, with some help and guidance from ace astrophysicist Dan Wilkins, Hubble should be able to image and see Webb. I see the Hubble Space Telescope orbits just above Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of approximately 340 miles, or about 550 kilometers. Hubble orbits at a speed of around 17,000 miles per hour, 27,000 kilometers per hour, and completes one orbit of the Earth about once every 90 minutes. By contrast, the James Webb Space Telescope orbits the Sun much further from the Earth at Lagrange Point 2, L2, keeping a straight line at all times between the Sun, the Earth, and itself, as it orbits the Sun once per year. Webb always looks outwards, away from the Sun, pointing its huge 300 meter squared reflective heat shield towards the sun and keeping its instruments at a temperature of less than 10 Kelvin and capable of producing the beautiful, low noise infrared data we have already begun to observe. So from the simple geometry of the system, the Hubble Space Telescope could observe the backside of Webb, perhaps a fitting analogy for some as Webb drives into the future, but JWST cannot observe Hubble. Well, I mean, it could, but it would have to look directly at the sun and it would be the last thing it ever did. Score one for the old timer, a phrase I hear myself saying more and more as I approach 40. Hmm. But of course, being able to look in the right general direction of something is not the same as being able to see it. I can look in the general direction of the black hole at the centre of our galaxy, the pillars of creation, or Taylor Swift, but to my great sadness, I can't currently see them. 
Whether Hubble would be able to observe JWST depends first on JWST's brightness in the darkness of space. For Hubble to see JWST, JWST must be bright enough for Hubble to detect and brighter than potential background stars and galaxies. Just as we cannot see the stars during the day as they're washed out by the sun, would JWST be washed out by light from the wider galaxy? Let's do some maths and find out. Fucking A. JWST has a highly reflective back shield that reflects sunlight that shines upon it. The luminosity of the sun, the amount of energy it pumps out per second, is about 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. This energy spreads out isotropically in every direction into space, spreading out over the surface of huge spherical shells. James Webb's massive gleaming protective back shield sits roughly 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters from the sun. That means that at the distance of JWST from the sun, roughly 1,350 watts of power hits every single square meter of the solar shield. That means that 400,000 watts, 400 kilowatts of solar power is incident on the 300 meter squared back shield. Given that the shield is essentially a huge mirror, the vast majority of this power will be reflected back towards the sun, the earth, and the waiting Hubble telescope. For all intents and purposes, the JWST back shield shines with a power equivalent to around 7,000 light bulbs. If we make the reasonable assumption that all the incoming solar energy is reflected, and the very worst case assumption that the back shield acts like a tiny star, emitting energy evenly in all directions over a half sphere back towards the Earth, knowing the distance between JWST and Hubble at roughly 1.5 million kilometers, we can calculate that the flux seen by Hubble from JWST reflections will be roughly 3 times 10 to the minus 14 watts per meter squared. This flux may seem incredibly tiny, and indeed it will get even smaller as Hubble will not be able to detect all of this energy as some will fall outside its detection frequencies. But notice that we used some of the harshest assumptions possible. In reality, far more energy is likely to be reflected back towards Hubble from JWST due to the geometry of the system. Okay, maybe not quite that much, but our estimate is a reasonable approximation. And believe me, I checked with a number of astronomers. But could this tiny flux be detected by Hubble? Well, let's compare it with other luminous objects within the galaxy. The distances of stars from the Earth within the Milky Way galaxy range from roughly as close as 4 times 10 to the 16 meters for Proxima Centauri, and as far as 5 times 10 to the 20 meters for stars on the other side of the Milky Way. If we place a fairly typical star like the Sun at these distances from the Earth and Hubble, we would expect a range of fluxes at the Hubble telescope from these stars between roughly 5 times 10 to the minus 9 and 3 times 10 to the minus 17 watts per meter squared. Hubble is more than capable of detecting sun-like stars at these distances within the Milky Way. And even far less luminous objects such as red dwarfs on the far side of the galaxy, such as UDF 2457 in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field at about 59,000 light years from the Earth. All this suggests that Hubble should be able to see JWST's reflective shield against the background of space. 
and that it should actually be easier to detect than a sun-like star across the Milky Way. It's less luminous for sure, but it's a hell of a lot closer. Flipping the maths over, the JWST back shield should show up with the brightness of a sun-like star a few percent of the way across the galaxy, or a brightness between that of Charon, Pluto's moon, and Calero, Jupiter's moon, when looking through Hubble. Magnitude 18 for any astronomers listening. So Hubble would be capable of detecting the glorious, shimmering backside of JWST, but would it be able to see any details? Sadly, not. The best angular resolution of Hubble is around 0.04 arc seconds, about one ten millionth of a degree. This is incredibly sensitive, for sure, but if you project that sensitivity out 1.5 million kilometres from Hubble to JWST, the smallest feature that Hubble would be able to resolve would be roughly 300 metres across. Since JWST is an order of magnitude smaller, roughly 22 by 12 metres, no details would be seen. The JWST back shield would simply show up as a fuzzy, undifferentiated blob. It would look a lot like a star far off in the Milky Way galaxy. You have to consider this interplay between the size of the object and its distance from the telescope. Hubble can resolve details in the atmosphere of Jupiter because although it is far away, it's also much, much larger. However, Hubble cannot see moon landers on the moon's surface, despite them being much closer, as they're also much, much smaller. This is similar to how you might be able to resolve the windows, doors and structure of a tower block hundreds of metres away, but not the wings and body of a fly, annoyingly buzzing just several feet in front of you. So Hubble would be able to detect JWST as a faint blob in the blackness of space. But if that's all we get, how can we be sure that it is JWST and not just a faint background star? The key to identifying JWST is to look for the motion of the telescope across the Hubble image as time passes. JWST orbits the Sun once per year. That means that it rotates through roughly one degree of its orbit every single day. Hubble has sensitive gyroscopes, drive wheels and control systems that allow it to continue to point at the same tiny patch of sky as it orbits the Earth. Instruments on board Hubble, such as the Advanced Camera for Surveys, or ACS, can capture a patch of the sky that is roughly 3.5 by 3.5 arc minutes, or about 0.1 degrees by 0.1 degrees. The same viewing window provided by looking at the width of a coin held at arm's length. It would take JWST roughly 2.5 hours to traverse such a field of view. So if Hubble were pointed in just such a way as to capture a patch of sky that JWST was due to pass through, you could literally watch JWST streak across the Hubble field in real time, while much further afield background stars and galaxies stayed essentially stationary in the same image. It's worth noting that Hubble orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes, and in low Earth orbit, its view of a particular patch of the sky is obscured for 40% of that orbit. So what we would actually see in our Hubble image, with just the right timing, is two streaks of JWST punctuated by a gap when Hubble passes behind the Earth. With the cumulative lengths of the streaks and gaps being in the ratio 
60 to 40. It would be hard to say that this object was anything but JWST, a faint star in just the right place for just the right amount of time. It must be JWST or a bizarrely tracking spaceship, one of the two. So yes, by my calculations, Hubble could image JWST. The scientific use case may not be the strongest, but it might be a nice nod from the old veteran to the new upstart. An acceptance that Hubble can still do some things that JWST can't, a beautiful outreach piece, and a nice verification that I sometimes know what the hell I'm talking about when I leave my particle physics cavern. JWST is science ready, and it isn't wasting any time breaking records. But Hubble is not finished. Let's not count the old dog out just yet. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.